So we now have uh, about 30 minutes or so, actually, for uh, uh, questions and so on from, uh, from the floor. Uh, so uh, uh, I'm going to start uh, this section, this section, this section, this section. Okay, so we start on this end. Uh, Jukka? Um, yes, thank you. I'm, I'm Jukka Pirtle. Jukka uh, Pirtle, University of Helsinki, Union Wider. Uh, thank you for the great panel. I have one uh, question and one uh, comment. So the question is that the, how do you see the role of behavioral economics, subjective well-being, uh, for the future of measurement of poverty and inequality? And then the comment or just an advertisement is that the, when we think about the, how to finance basic income, then we actually have a tool to examine financing it. And that's what we call tax benefit micro simulation model. And that's something we have tried to also develop in the in the in the UN wider here. Uh, thank you for your interesting presentations. My question is related to universal basic in income, of which a common critique that some of you did allude to was um, that it will lead to uh, well, deem working unnecessary and people must work or all hell will break loose. Um, so, and that almost leads to the philosophical question of the link between someone's job and a person's feeling of purpose in modern day society. So I wonder how you respond to this critique of universal basic income and more importantly, does it fit within the context of a developing country? Thank you. There were two great three great presentations, but there are two types of inequality which were not mentioned. One is going back to Ricardo, the share of profits, the share of factors, and I think this is absolutely critical, underlying a lot of inequalities and changing in the world today. The second is inequality between us and future generations who are not yet born. And I feel that this is something that must be built into everything we think about, because we are sacrificing them for us unless we think about them. So I'd like the panel to think about these two types of inequality. Hello, my name is Aliana Tuchene from St. Petersburg, Russia. I have a question, like, do you consider human rights are somehow influencing the inequalities worldwide? Thank you. Well, that's to anybody on the panel. Thanks. I'm going to try and answer everything. Um, you, uh, Michael's point, UBI are expensive. This is a kind of straw man here. Um, let's just take the money that you exist, for a start, let's take the money that you currently spend on, uh, countries currently spend on, on subsidies, on... Um, to including non-poor people, subsidies on food, electricity and so on, to the social protection, put all that together and ask yourself whether you'll have more impact on agreed social goals, including poverty reduction, if you spend the same sum of money on a UBI and then start from that onwards. And, and that, that's it quite important when we take this to developing countries because this idea that you know, UBI is too expensive, developing countries can't afford it is, is actually wrong, I think. I mean, I've done a lot of calculations in India where I, I'm, I'm persuaded that it's a serious contender in India, um, given the, the costs of, alter, of the alternatives. Um, Conchita's point about perceptions of in rising inequality, I think this is really crucial. Um, I think most people think inequality is rising because they don't accept the scale independence axiom. In other words, they think about absolute differences. They don't think about relative differences. Uh, I don't know that most people think that, but all the surveys, that are mostly of students, alas, have said that. Um, and that's really important because then people, they're talking from the ground. They're talking about a, a reality, a different reality to what economists are telling them is happening. Um, we have to take that seriously. Um, I won't answer all the questions. But behavioral economics is, is there, of course. Um, I just touched on it. Um, UBI... Um, is the job the center of your life? Obviously, that's going to change clearly, and not just in rich countries. Um, that's going to be a huge change going forward. 
Um, Francis's point, well taken. Uh, share of profits, well, of course, but that's, un as you said, underlying all of this. It's not, it's not absent, it's there, it's just not at the headline. Uh, but the second point on, on us versus future generations is absolutely crucial and, and good point. I wish I'd mentioned that. Uh, Elena on uh, human rights. Yeah, that's, that's in the story here. Most of the uh, argument, ethical arguments I talked about are about rights-based, not utilitarian. Yes, only maybe uh, the point by uh, Francis on the short profit and labor. I would say that uh, this uh, quite recent focus on uh, top share of uh, uh, top income shares of gross income is to some extent exactly about this. And uh, is really taking, I mean, and when you look at the evolution of a time of uh, this uh, inequality measure, uh, then you realize that uh, what you have behind that is really the profit uh, labor income uh, story. So it might be possible to relate it more directly, but I would say that, yes, indeed, in, the, in my uh, dashboard, this is uh, certainly one part which is, uh, which is, which is present. And uh, maybe I'll take this opportunity to uh, uh, tell uh, uh, Conchita that uh, uh, mobility was also really uh, definitely in my, in my uh, dashboard. Now, the problem with this kind of, uh, of approach is that you de definitely don't want to have 100 uh, items. Uh, so uh, maybe this is a work to be done by, by the collectivity, which is what is the minimum number of indicators that we would need in order to take into account the dimensions which we believe are really important in, uh, uh, in inequality. Uh, this is really, uh, I think, something which would be inc incredibly useful. Just a comment, uh, Francois. Uh, we had a, we had a, a conference at uh, Joe and I uh, organized with Ibrahim Patel, the, uh, the Minister of Economic Development of South Africa. And he said, you know, I, I, I recognize that GDP is a flawed indicator. But I turn around and you give me 262, <laughs> okay. and that's not useful to me, is what he said. And he then, he then, from his perspective, put forward seven, I think it was, or five or seven. But the point is, there will be different seven in different countries, and that's an issue for us also to, uh, to take on board. Is it going to be the same 10 everywhere, or is it going to be country-specific? Anyway, uh, on, on this side, yes, we have, we have Tony here, and then we'll come to you. Um. Tony Addison from uh, WIDA. Um, so uh, randomized control trials, are we at peak RCT? Thank you. Okay, Jean-Philippe Plateau from the University of Namur. So my question is a reaction a bit to uh, what Martin Ravion said, and that's in connection with something that Francois said. Uh, it is the following, that you're saying, why should we concern about uh, inequality? Uh, I would add that I'm concerned about rising inequality because of its impact on the political system that we are in and the social fabric. And I mean the following, that uh, if you look at the rise of populism in the world, and including in the advanced countries, uh, we see that the, big, the, the basic device is in education and levels of education. And why don't we focus more even in this panel discussion, about the problem of uh, rising inequality in access of sufficient quality of education. A basic problem in some country of Western Europe, including France, Germany, my own country, Belgium, etc., is that the average quality of uh, schooling is diminishing. Uh, Francois has mentioned in his dashboard the indicator of PISA. But what I would like to have is more about inequality in access to good quality of education. Because we all know that when the average quality of schooling is decreasing in countries, the rich can get access to good education, can have mentors for their children, can select a good quality education. But the average is being low. And these people are becoming more and more unqualified in a world where technology and skills are requiring more quality of education. So I think that we should uh, have more focus on some critical dimension that are causes of the rising inequality, and this appears to be a very important one, and I would privilege indicators of inequality in access to good quality education. I don't know what is your reaction about that. 
Hello, uh, Evgenia Bonazzinia from La Penranta University of Technology. I have a question more into the, uh, about the methodology and about data. Do you think uh, digitalization like globally can bring improvements to that? Because if we have like digital data and promote digitalization, for example, in developing countries, it would kind of help to obtain more accurate data. Plus, it would improve like education, like e-learning, uh, e-government, uh, also adding something like digital markets for for people who can actually like use it to improve their economic situation. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen Botedo Kwaite from the University of Ghana. I'm just curious to know from the panelists, to what extent do you think old age poverty is contributing to inequality and poverty generally, particularly when you take Africa and the consequences of HIV uh, and AIDS on families in, in many parts. And the fact that I mean, when you talk about basic in, um, uh, universal basic income, we're also looking at an apparent growing poverty amongst older people. And I'm curious to know the extent to which, if any of you know, old age poverty is a critical factor in this discussion. All right, thank you very much. Um, uh, since the, the panelists have covered a huge amount of things, so it's difficult to find uh, any, any, uh, anything to add. But quite interesting, yesterday uh, in the session I had with uh, Martin, I started off with asking people in the audience uh, how many people thought that inequality had been rising lately. And we got pretty well, uh, Martin will confirm, that we got 90% you know, of people in the audience think that inequality has been increasing lately. And yet, uh, the basic data, certainly on the income side, suggests that it's been falling. And this uh, sort of mismatch, you, you wonder whether, and this was actually after Martin had just given his talk and told people that inequality was going down. <laughs> they, still, they still got up and voted to say that they, th that they thought it would be increasing. Um, and, and I think part of this problem is when people, and I think inequality is a crucial thing here, and uh, you know, in some sense, poverty is a, a side uh, part of that, I'm not uh, trying to diminish the impact, but just saying, what is, how can we really uh, resolve this? And I think partly it's because when people talk about inequality, they focus on different things. Some people uh, think about just how, how much the poorer people are falling behind. That's one aspect of inequality. Or they focus on how much the sort of rich groups are uh, going, uh, drawing out ahead. And I think if you focus on different parts of that, you can get a different uh, view about what is happening to inequality. A second thing is, I think, perhaps over time, our reference group has been changing. You know, in the past, when people would, would talked about inequality, they, they had perhaps a, a local reference group, friends, neighbours, uh, you know, their relations and so on. Uh, we then perhaps uh, expanded to some sort of no national idea, but I think perhaps now, we, we have a, a bigger um, perspective on, on the group that uh, we're comparing against and, and judging. And that, that actually may, may uh, you know, at least be part of the explanation. But the other thing that, that really worries me, and isn't, I think is slightly touched upon by the, the previous uh, uh, point being raised here, is why are we, we, we are concerned about inequality, and we can, uh, I have always really think that wealth inequality is in somehow more fundamental than income inequality. And the reason is that it's not just affecting your standard of living, but it also gives you control of certain sorts of things. And this is, I mean, we haven't had this discussion, but I think this is, when we, when we get down to it, we are concerned about this. And lately, let's just think about what, what's been happening with uh, inequality uh, well, what's the relationship between inequality and the way that uh, it impacts on people? Um, first of all, in the media in the world, it seems now that all the media you c that seems to be growingly uh, owned by rich people. I mean, uh, and I don't, I, I don't know anyone's done, done a study of this, but if you did a track over time, it looks to me that more and more of the uh, the information that people get 
is, is coming to them via someone who is a rich person. And then you get the problem, particularly in the States, I think, where the whole political system has been taken over by, by richer groups, that, that somehow it, it is now, you know, how many people can run for president now that aren't billionaires? I mean, this, this was not true in the past and is progressively true, and it's not just in, in the US, it is uh, throughout the world. And then there's the, also the issue, of, I think, about uh, intergenerational issues. The more that wealth becomes important, the more it really is quite easy for this wealth to be transferred between generations. And so you get this break really between, so that the whole life chance is now, it is being more and more, uh, I, I, I suspect, it is becoming, uh, uh, you know, there's more a divergence really between the, the you know, future generations and the link to the current generation. And that, again, is part of the inequality that people are responding to. So when they say that they think inequality is going up, I think it's perhaps you know, taking into account these sorts of things rather than just looking at the data that uh, seem to be pointing in the opposite direction. So three things. First of all, um, if you age decompose either $1.90 a day or a global MPI, um, and look at the group that is 60 plus, so the AG compositions in 2016 by Newhouse or the Global MPI, which we did last year, you find that uh, old poverty for people 60 plus is one third the level of children, child poverty for $1.90 a day and about one half for MPI, so it's definitely lower, but not necessarily very different from adult poverty. But partly that's because these are household measures. Um, and in some cases, older people live in shared households, and in some cases, it's older people living alone in their households, where there are both issues of um, non-representativeness uh, because the surveys don't cover them, and also issues that other dimensions become important. The health cutoffs are different. There is no WHO growth standard of BMI for people 70 plus. They lose bone density. You can't use that measure. Um, and also there's aspects of loneliness. Um, so I think there are a lot of issues, and the new group on data for aging uh, populations, I think, should be very important in that regard. And I would just finally also wish to say that I'm not sure all of us agree that inequality is the only priority. <laughs> so I think that uh, just to put a marker on the map, maybe for income poverty it's uh, no longer a problem, but if you look at the 30 sub-Saharan African countries where we looked at changes over time, 30 of them had statistically significant reductions, but in 18 of them the number of poor people went up because of population growth uh, being outpacing reduction of poverty. So I think Perhaps not all types of poverty are off the map in terms of requiring research attention. <laughs> yes, two, uh, two, two points. Uh, first, on uh, Jean Philippe's point about uh, education, I think uh, we all agree with the fact that uh, this is uh, something which is extremely important. As a matter of fact, uh, the reason why I didn't come yesterday was uh, because uh, I was attending an event. Uh, where the, uh, Macron, the French president, was presenting his uh, anti-poverty plan. And it turns out that uh, the most important pillar is really on education and early childhood. Uh, and uh, I think this really fits uh, well what uh, uh, Jean-Philippe said. But the point is that <coughs> uh, I agree with the fact that it is not only when I re referred to PISA, uh, I didn't refer to the average score of PISA and the ranking, uh, international ranking of PISA. We don't care about this. What we care really about is what is the kind of inequality that we have be, be behind PISA. And uh, you have all the data in the uh, in this uh, uh, data set, you have all the variables that would allow you to see the way in which the result of uh, kids uh, depend on uh, the family background. But more than that, it's not only the cognitive part of the thing, but the, the, there is also information on the non-cognitive uh, thing, which is equally important. So here, I, I believe this is central, and this is the reason why I put that in my, uh, in my uh, dashboard. Uh, on Tony's point about uh, wealth inequality, I also put wealth inequality on, the, on my dashboard, uh, and, and I agree with you, the fact that uh, this is uh, uh, reflecting control uh, of uh, political control, which is extremely important, not only in the US. Uh, we just started with uh, some colleagues' work on uh, Benin, and this is another country where uh, you have a billionaire who is running the country, and who is running definitely the country to his uh, advantage. So this is something really very important. Intergenerational issue also important, but 
it is, again, one dimension of inequality. This does not say very much about uh, poverty, about uh, uh, inequality of uh, standards of living standards uh, today. So this is one dimension that has to be taken into account, but it is not the only one. Tony on RCTs, uh, have we reached the peak? I mean, this is, is relevant here because we, we, without evaluation, we're not going to know if it works or not. Have we reached the peak? Definitely not. It's going to continue. Um, it's a, um, a really, it's a bad news <laughs> for our evidence-based policy making going forward. We've got a massive distortion, in my view, associated with, uh, with, that, with the popularity of randomized control trials. I'm all for, for in favor of putting RCTs on the menu for evaluation, but they, they shouldn't be the only thing you do. I mean, they're not, uh, but the tendency to rely heavily on them and to exclude work that doesn't use randomized assignment is, is a real worry. Uh, and I think that's one of the attractions of WIDER's work program, I think, has been that it hasn't fallen for that temptation. It's looked at a broad set of development questions you know, it looks at the questions and starts with the questions and then figures out what kind of methodology is appropriate, rather than starting with a particular methodology and finding what questions you can answer with it. And that's a real problem going forward. Um, in, in, uh, intellectually, I think we've <laughs> reached the peak, but when you look at the number of people working on this and the number of students working on this and the, going forward, it, it's going to be even bigger. Um, I won't add anything, I think, um, Francois covered a couple of points. I mean, yes, in education, hugely important. I, I fold that under the inequality of opportunity stuff, but I, I didn't mention it explicitly. But uh, the point about digital data, um, I think going forward, one thing we're going to be looking at clearly is, is uh, data sets where we're large. Uh, the variance bias variance trade-off that we're used to in the past, this relates also to the RCT story, um, we're not going to be looking at uh, um, statistics which we rely upon largely because we think they're unbiased. We're also going to be looking at statistics which we think are reliable because of low variance. Um, that's changing already and we're seeing that in a number of areas um, and it's going to be important going forward. Um, uh, the only other point I'd add on old age poverty um, is particular groups, yes, like widows um, and who aren't necessarily old, <laughs> particularly in sub-Saharan Africa because of the age difference of marriage. Um, there are particular groups where this is a, a, a real concern. Old age per se, I don't see it as quite the issue, but particular groups interacting with age, where I think is a big concern. And the only thing I'd add to what Tony said, Tony said, Tony Shorrox, um, I think um, a lot of it, the misperception, the reason why 90% yesterday said inequality is increasing is, I think, again, most people think about inequality in terms of absolute differences, not relative differences. That's the first order thing. I think there are other aspects, um, but that's, that's clear to me now. And, and it's not clear. It's that we don't do that in our measurements, but it's, it's there. Thank you. Yeah, just also a point on RCTs uh, raised by Tony Edison. I mean, I think one risk that we have is that it somehow redirected the attention basically to targeted policies and that we lost sight a bit of more macro reforms. And I think these things have to come a bit more back on the agenda, in particular also, I mean, we discussed industrialization. I mean, that's clearly something that we won't solve with RCTs. Now, the second point, because here we does discuss inequality and poverty, I think many of these RCTs would have more utility for this kind of discussion if they made more effort to work out the general equilibrium effect. So not just focusing on the impacts of the direct beneficiaries, but to sort out, so what does it mean for the economy as a whole? What are the spillovers? What happens if we scale up these programs. So I think if RCTs can integrate more of these kind of problems, then again, it might also be more useful for lots of the questions that we addressed here. And then just a short point on the, uh, the thing raised by Jean-Philippe Plateau on the quality of education. I think one problem is, of course, that for, for the very poor countries, we do not have a lot of information about the quality of education. We know that's a, a problem but most of the surveys are still quite poor. I mean, we have some very special surveys where we have information, but then again, we don't have the link with all the other socioeconomic information. So somehow LSMS or maybe DHS would have to integrate this more to analyze this in more depth and then to work out 
what are the effects on uh, inequality dynamics. Thank you. Conchita, did you have any observations? Hi, I'm Tan Chankratang from Jilai Longkorn University in Bangkok. Um, I would like to hear the speaker's view on the role of norms or um, culture or informal mechanism in mitigating um, inequality. For this, um, I mean about um, charity. For example, um, citizens in some countries just actively participate in um, charity donations and that could be a substitute for formal transfer from the government. So um, I, I just would like to hear whether there's research work on this and how it can interact with uh, the formal redistribution program. We have one in the middle here. I'm from Fudan University, China. Um, I have a very simple, I guess, technical, might be important question. That is, when we measure global inequality, uh, it, of course, consists of two components. At the moment, really, we attach weights equally to the within country differences and the you know, country's difference to, to the global mean. It, it, is that right? Because, I mean, uh, or, or, or should we actually weight the two components differently? Because to me, it seems you know, inequality closer to, to one person is probably a little bit more important than inequality far remote. Thank you. Uh, uh, two, two small points. One, one is on Tony Shorrox. Inequality is rising or not rising, depending the, the, from the beginning and the last point. I mean, if you compare <clears throat> within country inequality between 1980 and 2015, inequality has risen a lot. There is no question about that. Now, if you compare what happened between 2000 and 2015, then you have the Latin American story. There are perhaps half of the African countries which also experience falling inequality, a few countries in Southeast Asia as well. So, so if you compare the time trend, you have to specify the beginning and the end of the trend. And I think that the, the, the argument is the poor are getting poorer and the rich are getting richer first to 1980 to 2015. On that, there is no question. Now, a second point is more on policy. <clears throat> I think that uh, I'm not so sure I agree with the Conchita about the idea of uh, guaranteed minimum income. And uh, I think that uh, in, uh, in Italy, for instance, this is one of the uh, main proposal of the current government. I think that w what is more important is to have a guaranteed job, particularly for the people who are part of the labor force. So the same resources that you can use <clears throat> for providing straight transfers, I think they can be used for other things. One is reducing the length of the working week. I mean, Keynes basically argued that uh, in 1930 that uh, in his famous uh, paper on the well-being of our grandchildren is basically that people um, at the end of this of last century, 70 years later, would have worked 15, 20 hours. Now, that was a little bit of an overshot, but people, the, the length of the working week has fallen by 60 hours to about 35 hours at least in the West. And if I'm not wrong, in Germany uh, last year, um, about uh, almost half a million people started working 28 hours a week. So one way to to fix the problem is to use these resources to further reduce the length of the working week. So a rationing labor. And um, industry is against, but then they will come to terms. And the other way is to say, uh, well, OK, we'll use these subsidies to reduce labor costs, for instance, and rather than providing straight transfer, because you do create moral hazard. Thank you. Uh, I probably if I can read uh, better what uh, if I can read what Martin said is uh, basic income is more for the developing countries than uh, I totally I'm not in favor of the policies of the current government in our country so don't uh, take me wrong on that and uh, the 
the reforms you mentioned about the reduction in the working time, uh, they are pretty costly, like the one in France that reduced uh, an hour uh, of uh, the week. Uh, the government uh, obtained that just uh, reducing uh, the, the costs for the firms on the labor, but it was really costly. So I'm not sure we can, uh, we can afford that too. And uh, my views on uh, delinking um, the, 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 the linking what you get from the job is what was more linked to the digital revolution, the automation, uh, the robotization that will change the labor market. So we will end up changing jobs, not having always a job. And uh, I was thinking of a way to uh, give something to everybody delinked from that. Yes, I'm coming from a country where we actually went from 40 hours a week to 35 hours a week. And this was really uh, a very, because of that, we had really a very difficult time. Uh, it is true that, uh, as Conchita said, uh, this was only possible because there was a huge subsidy made by the government to, uh, the, uh, to, the, to the employers to compensate for that, because of course, if you ask people, do you agree to have to work 35 hours paid 35 instead of 40 hours paid 40, they won't agree. But if you tell them you will have 35 hours paid 40, then of course, and this is what we did. And uh, uh, then uh, there was uh, uh, to head up, it was necessary to subsidize uh, uh, the firm. And this was a very, very difficult uh, uh, period. Now we are now in this new steady state. Uh, I think that people who are asking to come back to the 40 hours a week uh, are, have lost their case. But uh, this is to say it is not something that easy. And if you look at the number of jobs which were created because of that, it is very, very limited. It is a few hundred thousand, but it has nothing to do with the size of an employment in, uh, in France. Now, a point that I wanted to, to mention about uh, your, uh, your remarks, uh, Andrea, is uh, about the basic uh, income. I think you're, you're right in the sense that, uh, again, this is the experience of developed countries, uh, and I believe that this would uh, extend to developing countries. But in developed countries where we have something like the universal uh, basic income, uh, when this was introduced, uh, people said, okay, fine, we have an income to survive on uh, if we don't have any job, if we have been unemployed for three years, etc. But uh, we are not satisfied in the sense that we are still feeling excluded from the society. And social exclusion is something, I believe, equally important as uh, uh, the uh, lack of, uh, of income. And uh, so I'm not sure that uh, this is really the, the whole solution. And I would tend to agree with you that creating jobs is certainly much more important than, if it is possible, than uh, simply subsidizing people who don't have a, a, a job. And uh, uh, on uh, uh, your other point about the trends in inequality in countries, there is something which is quite interesting that when you look at the increase in inequality in most European countries, I'm not referring to the US, which is to some extent an exception, there is no trend in most European countries. The only countries with a trend are Sweden, Denmark, basically because there is a progressive uh, 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 going back on redistribution in those countries. So the redistribution system is becoming less progressive, and because of that, inequality is increasing. In other countries, what you observe is that there is one point in time where there was a big increase, uh, uh, such as uh, England, such as the United Kingdom. Uh, in Italy, the time where they uh, stop uh, with uh, scala mobile, with uh, centralized uh, bargaining. In, in Germany, when they started with the arts uh, uh, labor market reforms. In all those cases, you have for four or five years an increase in inequality, and then the uh, whole curve is flattening. This is a pattern that you have in many, many countries. Now, this does not mean that there will not be another 
uh, increase in inequality in the coming years, maybe. But we are not in the same situation as in the US, where you truly have a trend, uh, the, uh, the uh, slope of which is changing over time, but there is definitely a continuous trend. And I think this is something important to keep, to keep in mind. I think one of the interests um, in UBI here is also that it's a double um, benefit because it addresses poverty and it addresses inequality in the same intervention. And it could be interesting to think in other spaces of inequality of education, inequality of healthcare, that if you think of the distributions of inequality of those, um, they're much more shortened perhaps than an income distribution. And so in that sense, uh, interventions at the bottom of the distribution will perhaps have, again, both kinds of effects of addressing deprivations, but also of reducing inequality in non-monetary spaces. Um, OK, just things that haven't been covered. Um, on the question about charity and norms and so on, uh, here I think uh, probably one of the greatest philosophers of all time, Immanuel Kant, had the answer 200 years ago, more than 200 years ago, uh, that charity, private charity, is not a respectful relationship between, for poor people. It is not something we should um, rely on heavily. It can, we don't, you can't rule it out, but there is an important redistributive role for the state and more anonymous, anonymous and more respectful relationship between uh, poor people and rich people. And I, I wouldn't want to backtrack on that. Um, although I think with technology, there's, there's going to be some changes in, in how, we, how respectful, disrespectful charity could be. Uh, we can go into that. Um, the point about within and between decompositions, fully agreed. I think that's what I was getting at, that the between group component of inequality is, is more important than the normal measures suggest, as, as others have said before me. Um, I have nothing more further to add on the comments on Andrea. Uh, it's terrific. Andrea can make these comments. He, he missed them, all the presentations, you know. <laughs> he came in late, missed them all, and he still has good comments. It's really, <laughs> it's really great. F of, Finally, he agrees with me, finally, just on Francois's point, I really think in it's not too far distant future, we will never be saying things like what Francois just said, that UBI is subsidizing people who don't have a job. That, that mentality, my dear friend Francois, is going to change. Let me just conclude by saying that uh, for the incoming director of uh, WIDER, <laughs> Uh, Kunal Sen, you can see that there are plenty of issues, Kunal, for you to uh, be carrying on. Just to, just to pick up a few, uh, not all of them, is uh, where does the balance of attention go on poverty or inequality is one type of issue that has come up. Which inequality, if we're going to, which inequality uh, and which of the many inequalities, uh, including the 10 on Francois's dashboard, but also there may be many others. Then in terms of, uh, is, is it perceived inequality or measured inequality as we measure it in our conventional thing? So those are issues that have come up. And finally, on the policy front, you can see that the UBI discussion is, is, uh, is really going to be, is really already uh, uh, well engaged. And perhaps this is, this is wider is a, is a platform on which that discussion can proceed in a, in a safe and respectful uh, way. So with that, let us thank our panelists for a great, great session.